I've got the privilege today of introducing an old friend, old in many ways, huh? Dick and I began to know each other back in the late 70s when we were both in the insurance business. Dick has been in the venture for how many years? 30 some years. Very successful agent, Claremont. I had the privilege of being at his wedding party back in the 70s. And uh, when I retired in 92, as I, so many of us, I moved up to Northern California and kind of lost contact with many of my old friends. And uh, let's see, I think it was October 2013, three, three years ago, uh, that we moved back down, back to Southern California because we couldn't get any of our five children to move up north. So uh, we moved in the Oasis, and it must have been about three or four months after that that I got this telephone call from Richard. And I said, my golly, Richard, how are you? Where do you live? And he told me he, we were neighbors, practically. He lives, Richard lives in Sun City. And I just found out, really today, how you found out about where I lived. You would check what with the library. So he was really the hound of heaven. I feel very honored that he worked so hard to find, called up the library, and they somehow, we had just moved down here, and they had the information, and we renewed our friendship. And renewing our friendship, you know it's funny, I, I, all you guys, veterans, you know we talk about what we did in service, but as you get older, you just don't talk about it that much. And Dick and I were both, I was in the Korean War, Dick was in World War II, but we never really discussed, you know, as our business relationship and our friendship, the service. I knew he was in the Air Force, and that was about the extent of it. So as I talked to Dick, and I met him, I had the joy of going to lunch, and he told me about that he had this book published, and what I liked it, and I read it, and I was amazed. Really was amazed. You know, so many veterans that really have experiences in service, and as they get older, they think, you know, I really want to write a book. But how many of us yeah. have the discipline yeah. and the organization and the courage to stick with it and to write the book. And I, I got Dick's book, and I was amazed. I said, you know, he said that for all these years, I don't know what the heck he did. And his book is really interesting. And I think he's gonna just share some of his experiences. I thought it would be interesting for all of us to hear uh, some really some important kind of major things that he observed. And I'd like you, Dick, if you would, just to kind of share that, kind of summarize what you did in service and what you saw and how the end of the World War ended for you. Okay? My friend Dick Arthur. that it was a terrific uh, outlet for a person that had been adopted at the age of three months and had wonderful parents uh, that uh, supervised me in a very gentle, delicate way and they let me learn as I went along. And my life, in essence, at age 90 today, uh, has been an adventure. I think that is primarily what we all look for when we're young as uh, exploring those things that are most appealing to us and the essence of the things that we read about. When I graduated from high school in 1944, mid-year, uh, I had enlisted into the Air Force December 7th a very historic day. And that was the beginning of my military career and a life of 
all the expectations that I hoped it would entail. In the later years, as I look back on some of these issues that I confronted while I was in the service, and I experienced many, many different situations. And I'm going to share some of those with you today. Uh, at the encouragement of my wife, uh, I had written a mystery novel uh, as a result of my reading all the uh, Robert Ludlum books, and I thought, my goodness, I'm going to try that. <laughs> I've done enough reading, and I want to see if I can do that. Well, in about six or seven months, I had completed a book of 438 pages, wow. a mystery novel that I was really felt good about. It was creative. I had to create the situations. I had to create the uh, a good hero, a hero and a good heroine, and have a little love in it, and uh, a lot of different things that would be similar to what you may be familiar with, like a James Bond movie. And I tried to somehow incorporate that concept along with making it a very good mystery. And uh, as a result of that, uh, a very, I went to a creative writing class at the library in Sun City, and I met the gentleman standing over there, Mark Fletcher, who published, agreed to publish my book. Uh, I was very grateful for that. He gave me a lot of guidance, told me what I had to do, what had to be done, and so forth. And, uh, as a result of that, it went on Amazon, and some copies were sold. It wasn't made into a movie, unfortunately, <laughs> but that life is what it is. But at the encouragement of my wife, uh, and the pride that she had in my accomplishing such a thing for the first time at age 83, uh, I decided to, uh, with her encouragement, to write about my military career. I had kept a diary, up and I wrote down every single day. I made notes in it, where the mission was, what happened on that particular day, and what were the important things that I would like to remember. And with her encouragement, it was hard, because I had to regurgitate a lot of difficult things that I had put aside and taken out of my memory uh, of comrades who were killed and various other very unpleasant things. But I continued and I, I determined I was going to finish this thing. I started this project and I was going to finish it. And with some degree of difficulty and emotion I finally did get the book published uh, with my, Mr. Fletcher's help. How many pages? As a result of this, I had received a lot of notoriety in that uh, a young man who was doing some research on his grandfather who flew in our squadron, the 403rd squadron of the uh, back in the, in the South Pacific, uh, came across my book, and we carried on a very informative relationship in that he was very, he wanted to know more and more about his grandfather. Did I know him personally? As a matter of fact, uh, I, our pilot and his grandfather and our crews were very close. We almost had tents next to one another. And as this relationship grew, uh, we came to know more uh, about each other. And he found out that I had won an air medal with an oak leaf, and I had gotten one oak leaf cluster, and that I had qualified and earned a second oak leaf cluster in addition to all my other medals. And he pursued that uh, by calling Ken Calvert and asking him to research uh, this information that, and he sent a bunch of documents to Mr. Calvert 
uh, authenticating the fact that other members of our squadron had that were on the same list, the same page to get the second Oak Leaf cluster. Uh, uh, and he sent it to Calvert, and Calvert was working on it for many, many months, but to no avail. And the reason for that was the fact that my records and about 50 or 60 others of us, when they packed up the stuff to send it to the archives in St. Louis, as you know, there was a fire there, and many records were burned and never recovered. Consequently, uh, I know, and I had documented each and every mission that I went on, where we went, how we went, and all that sort of thing, to no avail, but I know I had earned it, and that was enough for me. In addition to this, all of these good, these things that have happened in, in, our, in my career there in the South Pacific, there were certain things that really stood out very dramatically. I might relate a story to you about our 15th mission. And I might say, for those of you who were in the Air Force and flew in Europe, if you lived through 15 missions, you were a qualified veteran. And the fatality rate by the time you got to your 15th mission in the squadrons there were horrendous. The fact that we in the South Pacific were in a different category, <coughs> that the Japanese never took prisoners, which the Germans did. And if you were bailed out of an airplane and they found you, you were bayoneted, and that was the end of that. Very few, very few airmen ever survived. Uh, fortunately, Senator uh, from Arizona was one of the survivors, and uh, he was very fortunate. Going on in about this 15th mission, uh, we had taken off and we were flying a mission to Taiwan. We arrived, uh, our nine airplanes arrived at the <coughs> scheduled place to rendezvous. And we circled and we circled waiting for the other nine airplanes. General Douglas MacArthur says this target must be destroyed at all costs. I came to know what that meant. After circling for some period of time, we finally decided uh, to go into the target. The Japanese were already shooting their any aircraft and howitzer cannons at us to try to shoot us down. And we went in on a scheduled <coughs> intelligence route to the target, dropped our bombs. But on the way out, one of the things I noticed I was the top turret gunner behind the pilot and the co-pilot. I looked up and I saw a Japanese <coughs> fighter plane right above us. And I looked up and it must have been about 150 or 200 feet above us. And uh, he had released a weapon against us. What it was was two basketball explosives with a chain. There, theory on this was they would come up behind us, get our airspeed, and then drop this, and if the thing didn't explode, the chain between the two large weighty explosive balls would rip off a wing and take you out. As I looked up, I saw the thing released, and I saw it falling. I was frozen in horror. And as I looked up, it missed our left engine by no more than a foot. And I explained, I said over the loudspeaker, to, did anybody see that? And uh, they had, it was a bit of a cloudy day that day. Uh, intermittent clouds, he'd duck into the cloud, and, and then you'd have see him, and then he'd go on to another cloud, and so forth. And. Uh, as a result of this, <clears throat> when we got back out and had gotten out into the away from the target, we then saw the other airplanes coming up. We couldn't break radio silence. We couldn't tell them don't go in there because we had 19 holes in our airplane. And 
we couldn't break radio silence, as I said, and they went in the same route that we did. When they first turned in, the Japanese must have had them measured. They hit the lead plane, and the explosion was so loud and so terrific, it exploded the two airplanes on each wing. I saw 30-some men fall into the ocean. It was hard recalling that and writing all that down. I had great compassion for those men, obviously. We made it back to the base and went over to help pack their goods and put their things together in our crew. Our crew did. Uh, we were fortunate. We had a captain as a pilot, a very good pilot. And when we got back to the base, he got out of the airplane, he took off his leather flying jacket, threw it down on the ground, sat down, laid down, and grounded himself. He never flew another mission. It had taken him. It had taken everything out of his stamina that he could deal with. That incident is related in the book and others that I had, that I'm fortunate enough to be standing here today to share with you. But some of the good things I might also want to share with you. Uh, I was, I am one of two living survivors that saw the first atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima, August 6, 1945. At Langley Field in Langley, Virginia, last August 6th, a monument was erected with a cornerstone to honor all the flyers in World War II. This book is in the cornerstone of that monument. It was 70 years ago, last August, that the bomb was dropped, and this cornerstone will not be opened up until the year 2085, another 69 years. I feel very privileged and honored that my book was one of the things that they put in there to be opened up in another 69 years. I've gotten a lot of publicity, uh, military people who flew in our squadron and in our 43rd bomb group of the 5th Air Force, I have, they have gone on Amazon and found the book, and I've gotten a lot of letters, a lot of phone calls, and I'm very honored and feel very privileged that they accepted my recollections for what they were, the very honest truth of what a young man, 18 years old, experienced. I went in, at, as I said, I enlisted in December 7th. I was taken into active duty April 14th of 1944. Uh, I was discharged 20 days January 26, 20 days before my 20th birthday. That was quite an experience and adventure for a young man. I was the second youngest person in our squadron. There was only one that was younger than I. So uh, it was a living adventure, to say the least. And I. I want to thank you for the opportunity to share some of these experiences with you. I hope that uh, if you find it in your in your in, that you would be interested in reading a book. Uh, you can see me after I get through talking, and if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them for you. Could everybody hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. I, I, uh, first of all, I need to tell you, I'm a blind veteran. My vision is 2400 in my left eye and 2200 in my right eye. So I saw somebody wave a hand over here. Yeah. 
you have a question, sir? I was curious, uh, the first book you wrote, the mystery novel? Excuse me. I'm also, oh, I volunteered for an, ex for an experiment at Lemur Field. Uh, I volunteered to do so a high altitude uh, test to show what it's like when you can't have oxygen above 10,000 feet. And something went wrong in the high pressure chamber that damaged my eyes, and I have a VA benefit <coughs> for ear damage. I have the same thing. Uh, sir, you have a question? In your, in your mystery novel, did you write longhand, or how did you uh, put 428 pages together? Well, I, I used a computer. At that period of time, I wasn't so totally blind as I am now. Fortunately, in 18, or 2013, uh, my eyesight was quite a bit better, and, I was, and I'm very fortunate, and God blessed me by letting me get the book, those books done. I, I have three books published by Mr. Fletcher, and uh, that, was, that was truly a very creative, rewarding thing for me to know that I could try something like that as a, a, as a new writer. And uh, but yes, the computer was a bit, was a was the machine and that made it all possible. He has since helped me by dividing my computer screen into uh, 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 two of uh, two parts. One is a very magnified half of what's on the other side, so I'm able to do a little bit and still keep in touch with my children and various other people who call me, but. That's, that's how I managed it. I, I have a question for you. We're both the same age. I'm 90, you're 90. Evidently, flying in B-24s as top gunners, both of us, uh, they must have they did something good for us, right? Where did you take your basic training? Uh, my basic training, I think, was... Uh, if I mentioned Keesler Field, would it be... The right place? No. I heard of Keesler Field, but no, that's not where. No. Okay, then forget about that. Where did you take your gunnery training? Uh, that was in a place down by Laredo, Texas. Oh, okay. You didn't go. You didn't do it at Tyndall Field, no. Florida. No. Okay, so we didn't. But we were doing these these things that you're talking about, basically at the same time. On the yes. same plane. On the same type of plane. Yes. I, my my first flight was in a B-24 from Apalachicola. And that's where they, uh, my, I pulled my first triggers to, for, to find out, you know, if I could hit the, hit the, the, the water on the ground, to hit, hit the set. That's what I did. So, uh, but uh, both of us did basically the same thing at the same time. Yes. You went to, uh, to the South Pacific. Yes. And I went to England. You had, a, you have a story about those two balls that fell down. I never heard about it. Did you ever hear about the, about the, 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 uh, the ball of fire? No, I have that one. That's a true one. And it, it's, it's like, if you go into uh, Foo Fighters, you can find out what happened to me at the same time. Flying at night, I only flew at night because I flew for the OSS. We flew agents and supplies. I didn't do bombing missions. And one night going into Norway, I believe it was, a ball of fire I saw at off my left wing. It stood about 300 yards off the wing. No matter which way I flew, it flew with me. It didn't attach itself. It didn't do anything. Uh, my co-pilot yelled out, stop looking at that, because there was a fighter coming in from the other side. So we thought possibly it was a German trick to get us eyes off. But after that, it disappeared. And we never knew for the past 50 years what it was. Today, the Germans got the same ball of fire. They, they saw the same thing. So you have so you have a story about two balls, and I have a story about a ball. <laughs> Any more questions for Dick? Yeah. Thank you so much, Dick, Tom. Thank you.